billions of people. And we're not talking about philanthropy or social enterprise. We're talking about billion dollar opportunities that will touch a billion lives. And I'm going to share with you uh, some of the work we are doing uh, via MIT uh, in India through a platform called Redux, redux.io, and two specific case studies of, of what, uh, how that's going on. Now, we live in a very confusing world, right? We, the largest taxi company in the world doesn't own any taxis, and the largest hospitality company by, by, by capital um, uh, by doesn't own any, any hotel rooms, um, and the largest media company doesn't own any media, and on and on and on. So very confusing world because the way the digital technologies are impacting the physical world. And this is leading to, this digital lifestyle is leading to some kind of hilarious conditions. So I was returning my rental car and I saw this sign about have you forgotten something? And there was a sign for uh, you know, tapes and CDs. I mean, who, who carries tapes and CDs? Um, and uh, clearly those things have disappeared. But then I started looking at this post from Earth Gallery and other things could disappear as well. W what is the next thing that could disappear? The keys, that's right. The wallet is almost gone. What else? The camera we don't carry anymore, un un unlike uh, the professional guys here. What else? The glasses, because the prescription could be on the cell phone itself or in a display uh, so that, you know, this pre-corrected for your particular vision. What else? Sorry? Uh, yeah, those things are gone, yes. What else? What about the phone itself? Because we might move very soon to wearables, implantables, you know, ingestibles, and even digestibles. <laughs> so, you know, we're, you know, this is, a, this is an interesting time for us. And this emerging technology that we're talking about and the billions of newly digital citizens that are coming on board, you know, the collision of the two is going to create some amazing opportunities. And so when you think about the next billion dollar opportunity, think beyond e-commerce, you know, think beyond hyperlocal delivery, think about games, think about beyond the dating sites. Okay, there's so much more we can do. All right, so, you know, we're going to get care without building hospitals, we're going to learn without school buildings. We're going to grow food without new farms with vertical farming, and we're going to transact in currencies that are not mandated by the government, right? So, you know, beyond big data, beyond internet of things, beyond newly digital citizens, if you really want to bring transformation in the lives of billions of people, this emerging worlds, as we call it, you, we cannot think linearly. You know, we cannot create a faster, faster horse, but we need a car. We cannot just build more landlines, we need a mobile phone. So we cannot think linearly, we have to think linearly, and we have to leapfrog all these challenges. So here are a few things that are going on uh, in our group at MIT, MIT Media Lab. Uh, how about a CAT scan machine that can be installed in a rickshaw? Or how about devices that go on on top of a mobile phone, you look through it, click on a few buttons, and gives you a prescription for your eyeglasses. Or how can we use virtual reality-like devices that actually look at the retina uh, of your eye and look at the hemodynamics, the blood flow inside your eye, so it can not only uh, diagnose the current conditions, but also predict what could happen, your hypertension, diabetes, any of the systemic conditions uh, in your body. And many of these technologies are already here. And this is my lab uh, at MIT, MIT Media Lab, and actually Shantanu Sina, one of our scientists, is here. So Shantanu, if you can just wave to the audience. Um, and as much as Shantanu is enjoying his stay at MIT and doing great science, uh, we also know that fortunately or unfortunately, the next five billion people don't live in Boston. And we have to go out uh, in places where some of the most amazing challenges, which in turn means most amazing opportunities, are out there. So for that, we have set up a platform called Redex, Rethinking, Engineering, Design, and Execution, and we are thinking about and executing 
this parallel innovation pipeline. And I was here about three or four years ago and gave a talk about how to invent, how to come up with new ideas called Idea Hexagon. I think some of you were here. Who was here? I see a few people nodding. Um, and this is basically algebra on ideas and how we can do something, you know, inno start innovating very fast. So let's, simple example, if somebody told you a great idea, you know, you know, you can share photos online. What would be your next idea? Yeah, share videos, right? Sold for $30 million, sold for $1.6 billion. Uh, so we can just generalize to the next dimension and sometimes it's become a transformational concept. Uh, and I'll just go through a few to give you a flavor. Uh, sometimes you can come up with the next idea by simply adding an objective. You know, you can make a faster, better, cheaper. What are some other objectives you can add to come up with the next idea? Smarter, efficient, smaller. What else? Personalized, cheaper, you already heard that. Automated, right? So you need to have a bag of such words with you. Some of the newer ones are social, personalized. You know, we have Wikipedia is encyclopedia democratized or Pandora radio is radio personalized, right? Things like that. Um, and you can keep adding any of these. And you can, every time you add an adjective, you'll actually come with a brand new idea and you can evaluate if it makes sense to pursue it. So here's a very interesting chart uh, proposed by uh, Jesse Shell that kind of explains the difference between being in college and being in the real world, right? So in the college, what happens is you, you acquire skills, you move on the horizontal axis, and then every once in a while you're challenged in exams or class projects and so on. So you make kind of a linear progress. Then a little bit more, and then you apply, right? Uh, and that's how you go from A1 to A2 to A4. So you're always in this zone of comfort. Learn, apply, learn, apply, learn, apply. But in the real world, what ends up happening is you're given a challenge and you don't know how to solve it. And then you have to quickly learn those skills and then come back uh, in this zone. And this is a very interesting paradigm because you know, if you learn too much, you'll get bored because you have nothing to apply to. At the same time, if you're given too big a challenge that you cannot solve, it will lead to anxiety and stress. So you have to kind of, kind of straddle this excitement and comfort zone. So kind of keep your own checklist of how far you're going. And you know, who wants to get bored learning new things? So you know, entrepreneurship is really about jumping in and then learning uh, as you go. So let me talk about uh, another strategy, which is doing exactly opposite of what everybody else is doing, right? Um, and for that, I'll use this Fosbury's flop example, you know. Uh, in the uh, before 60s and 70s, a high jump, you would run up to the uh, high jump bar and then land on your hand on your feet to avoid injury because of the sand pit. But in the uh, early, early 60s, Fosbury, who was a college athlete, realized that actually he can change that process because the sand pit was replaced by a foam rubber. So he could just walk up, he could just run up and then land on his back without worrying about injury. And Fosbury realized that in the whole ecosystem of an athlete, you know, their diet, their training, how they run up, how they land, one tiny thing had changed, which is the sand pit was replaced by a foam rubber. Long story short, he went on to win the Olympic gold in 68, and since then, everybody uses this Fosbury flop, as opposed to the method on the left. So this is kind of interesting for us, right? Because when you're reading a magazine, when you're talking to your friends, you see the top 10 awards, you see the world is changing you know, bit by bit. And you often think of them as, okay, this is kind of cool, no, doesn't have much to do with me, but every once in a while, you will see the sand pit changing to foam rubber, and that's going to completely transform uh, your world. And for me, the Fosbury moment, the, uh, the, the moment where I realized uh, there is a foam rubber is when there was an announcement of extremely high resolution displays uh, on your phones, you know, about five or six years ago. Uh, they called it retina display, but actually we can use it to measure your eye. And you know these devices to kind of see your, your cataract uh, in your eyes and you know, very age old devices. So uh, Mr. Sinha, who's a scientist at MIT, uh, originally from IIT Bombay, uh, is creating extremely portable solutions 
uh, in this space. Uh, and everybody over 50 years of age gets a cataract, so massive opportunity. Uh, to get retinal scans to look at the back of your eye, you know, these are quarter million dollar devices. Uh, but the funny part of this, you know, is check out the user interface because, you know, if the nurse doesn't get a good picture of my eye, you know what she's going to do next. You know, she's going to use my head as a mouse pointer and then just shove it so that my eye is aligned with the eyepiece. Uh, pathetic user interfaces. And then, you know, lost in a foropter uh, to get prescription of your uh, eyeglasses. Unless you're just in timber, like it's not, it's not a very cool picture. Um, so we came up with a solution called iNetra, which is a device to get prescription for your eyeglasses uh, on a mobile phone. Uh, looks like you know, Oculus VR, uh, but just for a few dollars, uh, you can play a game uh, on, this, on the uh, binoculars and gives you a prescription for your nearsightedness, farsightedness, and astigmatism. And it's already being sold uh, here uh, in Mumbai. And I learned a lot because this is one of the first startups we spun out from my group about you know, what it means to convert an idea into an invention, an invention into innovation, and an innovation into an execution. Um, and and uh, beyond this, I and my group you know, had a whole bunch of ideas beyond that. So, sir, we have an amazing uh, nail here, which is we want to solve problems about the eye, but what are some other hammers uh, we can use as well? So we had a whole bunch of ideas using optics, using cameras, using computer vision, using machine learning, and so on. And we said, if you start doing this one at a time, it'll take us too long. And by the time you know, we spin out and find a CEO and deal with the freaking investors, you know, it'll take too long uh, to do the whole thing. So how but we do this in parallel uh, in multiple stages. So we said, here, here are the uh, concepts that we think are worth solving. We had some initial ideas. Uh, and then we just invited hundreds of innovators to work with us. Uh, long story short, this has become a center in Hyderabad with Alvi Prasad uh, Eye Institute. Um, and uh, you know, now we're working with you know, dozens and dozens of innovators who are thinking about their next venture or their next effort and working on concepts that either I come from MIT or MIT is learning from its innovators, what are some next big challenges? <clears throat> and then we have expanded into another innovation center right here in Mumbai, uh, which is in Matunga. And there we are looking at other opportunities such as oral health, you know, sleep disorders, uh, hearing tests, uh, and so on. Um, so I think now we're talking about an opportunity where often you get into a situation where Great teams, you know, I'm sure many of you, great teams are working on problems that are maybe not so interesting. But you're so gung-ho about it, you have so much ego, and you have so much attitude about it, that you want to stick to this idea, which may or may not be so impactful. Uh, and on the other hand, sometimes you get not so good team. It just turns out they encounter that problem, or they know somebody who's in that space, and they're working on this amazing, amazing, important problem. But the likelihood that a great team is working on a great problem is unfortunately very low, right? Because the team formation, exposure to all the opportunities, exposure to capital, all these things have to come together for great teams to work on great things. So what if we can solve that problem and actually create a new ecosystem where people are more passionate about changing the world for the better, but not necessarily egoistic about working on their exactly their own problem, right? And this is a very interesting new innovator's dilemma. Some of you have read that book, which is we have to just accept that often the innovator is not the entrepreneur. I'll repeat that. Often the innovator is not the entrepreneur. And there is a particular baton passing that has to happen from an innovator to entrepreneur. I mean, every once in a while, you know, you'll get somebody like Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg or Windsurf who will go all the way. But as we start getting into fields where we want to impact billions, it's challenging. If you're working on something relatively well understood, like the examples I gave you earlier, like e-commerce or hyperlocal delivery and so on, you don't need fancy innovators, you know. But if you want to do something more complex and something that's really going to change, make a big difference, uh, and you know on day one that it's going to make a big difference, then somehow this baton passing has to take place. Uh, so that took us to the next experiment, uh, the MIT team, which is looking at Kumamela, 
which is, you know, 30 million people show for 30 days. The previous one was in Nasik. Anybody here from Nasik? Oh, excellent. And how many have you been, have been to Nasik? Okay, very close, you know, two and a half hours from here. And we said, let's bring in a lot of interesting players who can start looking at issues in housing and transport and water and health and education and transactions and civic issues and so on, and can we solve these mega problems? Um, and and uh, surprisingly, uh, the, you know, the Nasik administration who was working with our MIT team and a local organization called Kumbhathon and RedX, you know, kind of mix and no, you know, Sita or Gita or, you know, nobody lost and no children lost. Um, so that's kind of interesting. So they gave us some confidence to see what can we do next uh, moving forward. I'm going to skip this video and talk about what's happening in Nasik through this Redex platform. Now, you know, there are elements of uh, many of these words that you have seen as part of an innovation ecosystem. But on their own, they're not complete. So although we're looking at these groundbreaking challenges, and, and expecting innovators to participate and take this forward. It's not a contest. We are not self saying, let's solve you know, malaria and, and give awards to teams because the, the, base of the rest of the, the, the ecosystem doesn't exist. You know, if you do a contest, usually you'll only get people who have some free time on their hand to play around and see if they can participate in that contest, right? And it's, it's less likely, I'm not saying it's unlikely, but it's less likely that people who really have the expertise and, and, and you know, the drive, that they will spend the next six months or a year of their life working on this contest, which they know they may or may not win. Uh, hackathons are great, absolutely awesome, and we should have more of them. Uh, but they may or may not have a lasting impact, because after the two days or one week of hackathon, how do you make sure uh, this, uh, this concept actually move on? And more important than, how do we make sure in hackathons people are actually working on problems that are very important? It's not a degree program. Uh, also, incubators and accelerators. I think we're hearing a lot about that. So let me, let me say a little bit more. Just like we have leapfrog landlines and went straight to mobile phones, I think there's a time to rethink the incubator model as well. The incubator model assumes that somehow there's an amazing mix of people who can form teams on their own figure out what are some great problems they should be working on that will have a good product market fit. There's some good mentorship that will all come together and then they will come to the incubator where the incubator can vote up or down, whether they accept them or not, okay? And this model works in Europe and, and in Boston and Silicon Valley because there's, you know, the mix, the bag is so big that something good will come out of it. But it's also a very inefficient model because what I said earlier. I think coming to a leapfrog model, you know, in a country like India and, and other emerging worlds, I think we have to think that again. Is, is it possible for us to short circuit that and encourage an ecosystem without building the whole base, you know, universities, uh, you know, seed funds, you know, all the rest of the things, instead of building all of that and putting incubators, accelerators at the top of that pyramid, you know, can we build a different ecosystem where actually a lot of these interactions happen well uh, in, in much shorter cycles. And that's what we're trying to do uh, in NASIC. And of course, it's not a corporate innovation center uh, where you know, it will be challenging for multiple organizations to work together uh, going forward. So the NASIC integrated e uh, innovation system is kind of unique because uh, it's not just the startups and incubators and, and, and so on, but the business leaders are also helping. Imagine the whole head of hospitality system is working with you. Imagine if the head of transport system is working with you. Imagine the head, the government heads uh, in health or education are working with you. Um, and, and of course, international partners like MIT and, and uh, international companies uh, like Facebook and Flipkart and, and many others are also part of it. So that's interesting because now you can walk into something that you can plug in and start executing on day one. Now, this makes it very, very interesting. Of course, it's just getting started, so I should not claim that this is a successful model, but I think it's a model worth trying. Uh, 
So uh, you might have read in the news uh, on 1st of March, uh, uh, a whole new facility is going to be functional, you know, tens of thousands of square feet of space, uh, multiple corporate partners, but a completely open innovation ecosystem, and, and one year of paid internship where innovators can come and work on the most important problems of this world. And at the end of the one year, they can do what they want with it. <clears throat> so that brings me to another point, which is the distinction between uh, digital technologies and digital technology impact on physical systems. Now, we all talk about apps. And I'm sure many of you, when you write apps, you kind of get annoyed when people say, oh, I just have an app. I can download that. But in fact, we are transitioning to a world where apps are also having an impact on the physical system. You know, transport, food, housing, and so on. And so I think it's better to call not apps, but dApps, you know, digital applications for physical systems. But that's still one-to-one -one interaction. You know, I want to find a hotel room. I'm just going to you know, use a, a digital app to get a physical solution. But we will soon move into the third phase of it, which I call CAPS, which is connected applications for physical systems. Because the, the power of the social graph, the power of people-to-people -people connections is extremely strong. And while dApps are finding local optimums, the caps will start finding the global optimums in the solution. So to snap out of local optimums to global optimums, we have to go from dApps uh, to caps. So this is also a very interesting opportunity coming up. So hope you know the idea hexagon is, is useful for you to challenge the way how you're thinking. Um, uh, I'll, I'll skip over this. You know, there are a lot of, lot of blogs and, and, and information on my website. You can check it out. You know, is it something worth starting? Uh, you know, I can ask Helmar's questions. And this is a useful one. If you know you're going to work on something, make sure you have at least two out of three. Okay? It should be fun. It should be uh, challenge you intellectually, and it should have an impact. And some extras I'll skip over for now. So, all right. So to conclude, I have five more minutes. He's telling me. Uh, so to conclude, uh, I think we are in an era of digital impact on physical lives. Uh, we have to rethink relationship between inventors, innovators, and entrepreneurs. Uh, and we have to think about ecosystems that don't simply copy the incubator accelerator model of the rich world to make impact on billions of lives. Thank you. I guess we have time for questions. We can have two questions. We can have two, two or three. We can have two questions. Uh, again, Ramesh, this wonderful you know, presentation, a lot of deep thinking there. I was saying hi to you and the mic came to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm Chakravarti. I had the design school here. Uh, uh, Ramesh, this uh, concept which you were just you know, uh, elaborated, the uh, Nasik Innovation Center, uh, seems phenomenally, uh, you know, a dream come true sort of situation. So in this type of ecosystem, what are the collaterals? How do you look at the whole, uh, you know, uh, the uh, sort of the support structures, whatever it is? All these government agencies come in, right. uh, but how, how do you look at the mix? How do you look at the yeah. methodology part or, you know, do you just leave everybody free? Absolutely. Uh, good question. Um, and if you think about, you know, an ecosystem, uh, the, the challenge for a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of startups, is that you need a beachhead. You know, you need something sufficiently small that you can control and understand very quickly and then iterate. Uh, and then the reason why we chose Nasik, you might wonder, it's like just a, you know, a big village, right, up the road. Uh, why Nasik and not Mumbai or Pune or Bangalore? Is that you want an ecosystem where you can try out ideas for the next billion, right? Uh, so if you have to have an access to the city commissioner or the police commissioner, you know, or the head of the education institutes, it's not going to be possible in a metro city. They're too busy. But if you go to a slightly smaller town, actually it turns out you can make it happen very quickly. I mean, I'm on WhatsApp with all of them. This morning, I was, uh, yesterday I was meeting the chief minister. This morning, I was meeting the health minister. And I just sent a message saying, hey, listen, can you give me your ideas on what, I should, what should be my talking points when I meet the health minister this morning? And I got like 20 uh, uh, you know, messages from you know, the chief of police, you know, the chief of the medical university there, you know, the, the city commissioner himself, doctor. He's, he's a city commissioner, but he's also a doctor. 
a medical doctor, uh, Dr. Gedam, and so on. So it's a, it's a very quick iterations uh, that are possible in this, in this sandbox. So it's not just the fact that all these players are present and they're willing to help you. It's that there's a mindset in the, in the city of Nasik where they want innovators to succeed and they want Nasik to become the lab of the world where anything that impacts, anything that takes digital technologies for physical systems and have an impact on the life. I mean, we're not talking about building the next nuclear plant or doing the next synthetic biology. We're talking about anything that involves impacting people's lives instantaneously. So that's the interesting part of this uh, sandbox. Uh, uh, what about the methodology? Like, how would, uh, how would they be mentored? And you know, how would that happen? And yeah, so uh, all the details are on our website. Just go to redx.io. Uh, and please apply as well, because we only have a month to make the final, uh, sorry, only, I forget, uh, February 16th is the last day for you to be selected for this cycle and the next cycle. So make sure you apply. So even if you have a startup and you don't know where to go, just go online, submit, tell us you have a team, uh, and then you might be selected uh, to go there. Uh, and the involvement of MIT is also very exciting because uh, MI although MIT cannot have an official presence, uh, physical presence uh, in India, intellectually we are very involved because of the relationship between the corporate partners uh, and MIT. So, so um, you know, all the stakeholders are contributing to problem statements, a lot of mentors, including MIT mentors, uh, and of course, mentors across India. Uh, I know there are hundreds of innovators coming in, there's plenty of funding, there's plenty of uh, space, and then you have a ready-made market where you can test those ideas. Let's take one more. Yeah, no, we just ran out of time. They're out of time. Yeah. See you later, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, May I have Sakshay to present a token of memento to Mr. Ramesh on the dais? We have time for the memento, though. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.